Our scripture reading today comes from Luke 4, 16 through 21. And Jesus returned to the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and, rem and a report of something he went out through the surrounding country. And he taught all of their synagogues, be begin glorified by all. And he came to Nazar Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and he and as was his custom. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the liberty to the captives and the recovering of the sight to the blind and to the liberty of those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And his eyes were on the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today is the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of the Lord. Please take your seats. Thank you, sir. All right, good morning, everyone. If you have your Bibles, we are in Isaiah but you guys probably already knew that. All right, so we are in Isaiah chapter 59, um, and we have got a lot to cover, so let's get going. Um, Isaiah 59 um, is, is one of these chapters. Um, I, I know Mark talked about this a couple weeks ago. He, he uh, preached on this. But Isaiah 59, it's, it's like this confession of the people of Israel that they know they're doing things that they're not supposed to be doing. They, they know the reality of the current situation, and it doesn't look good. Um, a few years ago, I watched a movie. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard of it, but it's a movie called uh, the, the Big Short. A lot of famous people are in it, I think. Um, it's a, it's, but it's a, it's a movie about the 2008 housing crisis. Um, and if any of you are familiar with kind of what happened back then, um, or who have who know anything about it. It's all really confusing, and I'll, I'll be honest, I am not a numbers guy. I am not, a, so the idea about credit default loans, credit default swaps, and all this kind of stuff, it's just kind of Greek to me. But the movie does a pretty good job of explaining how the marketing or the, how the housing market crisis happened. Basically, the two big things are this. There's some really influential, powerful people with a lot of money, and they decided to um, create products to sell to consumers um, that would um, get them into homes, but they were bad products. There was the subprime mortgage crisis, and, and what ended up hap happening is this bubble, this housing market bubble, ended up bursting, ended up breaking. And, and what happened as a cause of that? People lost their homes. People lost their jobs. Because of, some sev because of some decisions made by influential, powerful people, people were out of work. People lost everything. Now, if you were to look at that today, we, we would say that's not how the housing market is supposed to work. It's not supposed to work that way. We're not supposed to have people taking advantage of people who just want to find a place to live. We would say that that would be some sort of an injustice, right? Um, and from, from all accounts that we know, two big things happened. Lots of people lost their homes from people who were more powerful, more influential, and more wealthy. And two, those people were not held accountable from all we know. People got away scot-free. So there's this idea that injustice takes place in this world. We can, we can look at it through, through that housing crisis. We can look at it through natural disasters. This world is not the way it should be, and we know it. And here in Isaiah chapter 59, the people of Israel know it too. The people of Israel, in, at, at the very beginning, behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and God. So God is here saying, I'm not so far from you, but what is happening is your sin, you are holding me at arm's length. You are saying you don't want me around. And because of that, injustice and, 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 and sin creeps into social life. So we start in verse 14. Verse 14 says this. 
Justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the public squares and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice. The community is not how it should be. And there, is a, and, and there is an inevitable link here. There's a link between the presence of Yahweh with his people and justice and righteousness occurring in the community. When Yahweh is far off, un, uh, unrighteousness, injustice is also missing as well. So there is an inextricable link that justice and righteousness are non-negotiable aspects of a viable community life. So the big idea today is this. Did I turn it on? Nope, I didn't turn it on yet. Now it's on. The big idea that we have today is this. Only God's blindingly bright grace can bring true shalom and justice to the world. And we're going to see that pretty heavily here. So let's keep going. Justice and righteousness are not there. Um, the way the world is working is it's not how it should be. Even truth is depicted as the city drunk. Truth is stumbling and stammering. You can't believe anything that truth is saying. That's how bad life is. That's how bad the social fabric of this, of this community is falling apart. And there is no one to mediate justice and truth for Yahweh. The Lord saw it in verse 15, and it displeased him that there was no justice. Verse 16, he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. I don't, I don't, know, about you, I don't know about you, but if you ever go to the grocery store um, and, you just, and, and you buy everything for, for, for the week, you've got all these bags and stuff to take in from the car, okay? My kids, they don't want to help at all, which, which, which is fine. So, so what do I have to do? In... In my cries out, I say, there is no one here to take in the groceries. So what do I do? In one fell swoop, because that's the way to do it, right? In one fell swoop, you're just loading up on grocery bags so you can take them in in one, in one big act of justice. And you can be like, look at what I have done. I have brought in all the groceries all on my own because there was no one to do this for me. In a similar but completely different way, God steps into the situation here, and he says this, the Lord saw and it displeased him. Then his own arm brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him. That is good news, but here's the, but, but, but here's the thing. It doesn't sound like good news at first. Let's keep reading. God has to send someone that looks like a warrior. In verse 17, he puts on righteousness as a breastplate, helmet of salvation on his head. He, put, he, he wraps himself up for battle. In verse 18, according to their deeds, so he will repay. Wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies. Anybody signing up for that? Is anybody signing up for repaying all the injustice, repaying everything that you've ever done? No one's signing up for that. That doesn't sound like good news. But the chapter doesn't end that way. Verse, verse 20, it says this, And a Redeemer will come to Zion those, to those in Jacob who turn from their transgression. And as for me, there is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says the Lord, from this time forth forevermore. There is going to be a Redeemer. And the word it uses is a goel, a kinsman redeemer, someone like you, someone from your family, and he's going to come and he's going to redeem you. But it pairs it with vengeance. It pairs, this, it pairs it with this idea that there will have to be some sort of repayment. So the first point is this. There is no one to mediate justice and truth. Chapter 59, is, it's about this. Life is not the way it should be. And there's no one who's going to step in and make it right. So what does God have to do? He's got to take his arm of salvation, and he's got to send this mysterious figure. We call him the anointed conqueror. And he's, and he's, and he's going to be the one to come in and redeem and repay for all the deeds that have been done. But the, the chapter doesn't end with just the fact that God is going to repay, re, repay. It ends with the fact that God is ready to intervene in a way that's going to surprise people. Chapter 60. 
Second point, the missional thrust of God's grace is that heaven and earth don't seem so far apart anymore. Okay? Um, we, the, the, in the church calendar, Epiphany is, is celebrated, I think, the second or third week after Christmas. Um, and it's, the, it's, it's this idea that light has come into the world, that light has come into darkness, and there's hope, and there's joy, and, and there's excitement again. And here it says this. This is what's read every epiphany. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you as well. So here God is showing his presence to his people again. This is what was needed. God's presence needed to be with his people again. And we see a couple things here, that God is the light of the world. That when God shows up, when God is here, darkness goes away, light and hope enter in. But not only is God the light of the world, it's that you can be the light of the world too. Right? Verse, uh, verse, verse 2, the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you. Why do we become the light of the world? So, is that, so we can showcase the light of the world to the nations. That's been the plan from all along. That's been the plan from the beginning. When God shows up, the light of the world changes everything. But without this light, we are left in total darkness. And this is the opposite of chapter, chapter 59. In chapter 59, um, verse, verse 10, it says, We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope like those people who have no eyes. We stumble in the noon. It's bright outside, and yet we're still stumbling around because we are in complete darkness. We growl like bears, we moan and moan like doves, we hope for justice, but there is none. Darkness overtakes us, but until God steps in, until Yahweh steps in, we are left hopeless. So, so, I, think in, so I think what God is doing here in, in this chapter, he's doing this. He is showing his unmitigated resolve to work goodness for his people that will feature safety, well-being, well-being prosperity, and abundance. Okay, let's dive into that a l- little bit. Chapter 60, verse, uh, verse 3. And the nation shall come to your light. You are going to be an attractive people. People are going to see what life is going to be like when Yahweh is ever present. The nations will come to your light, and kings in the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see as they gather together, they come to you. Verse 5. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult because the abundance of sea shall be turned to you. And then, it, and then it gets a little, little bit specific. What is that going to look like? There's going to, all the nations are going to bring the works of their labor as tributes of worship to this, to this new city, to this light. You're going to have, you're going to have camels, you're going to have rams, you'll have gold, you'll have frankincense, you're going to have silver, you're going to have doves, you're going to have all of this stuff. Foreigners shall build up your walls, and their king shall minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, but in my favor I have had mercy on you. Your gates will be opened continually. Day and night they won't be shut. For the, na- for the nation and kingdom um, that will not serve you shall perish. Those nations shall be utterly laid waste. Doesn't this sound like a, like a completely different picture from what we've been reading in chapter 59? Something is different. This would be a city that would be awesome, right? We all long to live in a city that's like this, where work is valuable, where people are worshiping with their, with, with their stuff. Your work here will have immense value, right? I don't, how, do you get, how do you get silver and gold? You've got to mine it. You've got to get your hands dirty. You've got to dig in the dirt. You've got to, you've got to get messy and muddy. How do, you, how do you shepherd camels and rams? We've got to step in manure occasionally, right? Like, it's like this messy, dirty work is, it turns up to be an object of worship to God who is the light of the world. So work has changed. Economies have changed. Right? There's busy ports, right? There's, there's ships that are coming in and out to and from. There's loading docks. There's crowded scales. There's the hustle and bustle of life in this city is what life should be like. Systems will see 
later on um, in, in the passage that um, justice and righteousness are now your taskmasters. They are the ones who are ordering everything. Righteousness and justice are the ones who are setting the right order in this new city. The city sounds great. The city sounds real life, right? Like we're, we're talking about fishing ships. We're talking about shepherds and miners. This is, this is like the real dirt that we're standing on right now. Systems, when peace and shalom are the taskmasters, things thrive and flourish. And then people, there's going to be no more violence. Verse 18, violence shall no more be heard in your land. Devastation or destruction within your borders. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. We're starting to get hints of what the, city's, what the city actually is. When there's no more violence, do you know what this means? Relationships are restored. People are not in want or in need anymore. Their needs are met. And then we get to uh, verse 20. Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. Okay, now we get a full picture. This is paradise restored. This is new heavens, new earth. This is when all things have been set right, this is what life should be like. If God is the light of your, of your city, if God is the light of your community, you don't even need the sun anymore. This is new heavens and new earth. Isaiah 60, you could, you could almost boil it down to, um, this is kind of an outline of the entire New Testament summed up in one chapter. The curses of Genesis are reversed. All of the nations of the world are gathering together to worship the rightful ruler, the actually true and just king. They're bringing their, their work, their, their products as a response of worship. Violence is gone. The sun is no longer needed. And this is the picture of paradise restored, new heaven and new earth. Sounds like there's a lot of overlap here, right? The point here is the missional thrust of God's grace is once God's light is among you, you have his light, you share in that as well, and then you change the world because God's light is there. Where work, economies, systems actually work for flourishing. Where there's no more violence because people's needs are met. And this is all things that the Lord does. Next section, chapter 61. God's new people are to be a jubilee people. Okay, so the first few verses of 61, we, Ella just read, Jesus um, quotes this passage in Luke 4, 61 verse 1, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, and has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to, pro to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Um, we're kind of in that new campaign season, right, where... Um, the presidential election is, is what, 2020, November, so people are, so the Democrats are really starting to throw their hats into the ring and trying to make their case for why they should be the nominee. Um, and, and any type of campaign like this, political campaign, when you announce your campaign, what's the one thing that you want to make sure that you communicate? This is what I'm about. I'm telling you, like, this is going to be my campaign, whether it's healthcare, whether it's the environment, what, whether it's the economy, whatever it is, you kind of put, put pillars into the ground and say, this is what I'm going to be about. The same way that Jesus does the same thing in Luke 4, his first sermon in, 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 his, in his public ministry, and what does he say? He says, this is what I'm all about. I'm going to proclaim good news to the poor. There's economic brokenness, and he proclaims good news to the economic brokenness. He's, he's going to bind up the brokenhearted. He's going to deal with emotional and social brokenness. And he also says that I am going to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, we don't fully understand what that is. Um, unless you kind of want to read back into Leviticus chapter 25. And I don't know if many of us want to actually read Leviticus because it's not the easiest thing to read. But Leviticus 25 describes what's called as the year of Jubilee. Okay? Um, let me just give a quick rundown because I think it's going to be hugely important to the rest of this chapter. Um, 
Someone, someone tell me, what, what is the high-level, 10-second view of what is the Sabbath? Like, what are the nuts and bolts of the Sabbath? Anyone? What's, day of rest, right. Um, uh, one day in seven, you are to take off. You are to rest. You are to enjoy the fruits of your labor. You are to recharge because you aren't God. You get tired, right? So you are you're to take a day of rest. Then there's this thing called the Sabbath year in the Old Testament. And the Sabbath year is every one year in seven, um, a couple things were supposed to happen. When someone threw poor crops, uh, misfortune, poor management of their crops, um, they, they would come to a place where they could no longer repay the debts that, that, that they owed. They, they kept, the debts keep piling up. You can't pay off your debts. You would become an indentured servant to someone um, until you, either your debts were paid off or until the Sabbath year. Some people could, this, this was a system that, that happened where in a very um, short amount of time, you could either become fairly wealthy fairly quickly, or you could become pretty poor fairly quickly. But on the Sabbath year, all debts were forgiven. All indentured servants were set free, and the land was to lie fallow, and you were to enjoy the fruits of your labor from the grain and the fruit that you've stored up in your warehouses. Everyone rested, and the land rested too. But then there's this thing called the year of Jubilee. And this is so radical. This is so different. Um, we don't even know if it actually happened. Um, but God's plan was every Sabbath, Sabbath, okay? Every seven Sabbath years, on the 50th year, there was to be a Jubilee year. Not only debts were relieved and people rested and the land rested, but there's there this, there this one thing. If you had lost your land, again, due to poor misfortune, um, due to poor management, due to bad decisions, due to poor crops, if you lost your land, your family's original land that's been with you for generations, that land would come back to you. Okay? Now, us in suburbia or in here in America, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. What's a big deal? Um, you lost your land, go find new land. Well, that's not exactly how it worked. Um, if you had lost your land, your, the rest of your lineage is in trouble. This is where you, this is where you set up shop. This is, where you, this is your economic base to thrive and flourish in any type of community. And if you lost your land, not only were you in trouble, but your kids were in trouble. Their kids were in trouble. They had no means of economic base to pull themselves up by their bootstraps anymore. It couldn't be done. So the year of Jubilee comes in and says, if you lost your land, uh, the year of the Jubilee, you would get your land back. You would get some sort of economic base to continue to work, continue to cultivate that land and thrive. So how, how do we make sure that if you blow it, you could get a running start again? How, how, were, how were laws made in these systems that if you were to make a mistake, that if you were to suffer bad consequences, that you could be up and running again? This is a way to break poverty cycles. This is a way to break, um, to break years and years of wealth issues. There were, system, there were systemic institutions built into this just society that kept equity and shalom in mind. This is, this is, the, this is a little bit far, of, uh, far off from a meritocracy, right? This is different. God set up a way for you to be whole again with justice and flourishing and shalom in mind. So this year of Jubilee is not just a spiritual rest where um, you rest and you're thankful. It is that. It's not just a physical rest where you rest from your hard work. It is that. But it's also a system of economic rest and flourishing. And the, and the crazy thing is, is the Messiah shows up in his first public sermon. He says, I am this. I am the year. I am the Jubilee. I am here to proclaim good news to the brokenhearted. To, play, to proclaim good news to the poor. Then we continue on in chapter 61. And it says how strangers will stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers. There's also racial harmony in this new city. 
Strangers will stand with you and take ownership and responsibility for the flourishing of the city. Economic flourishing, racial flourishing, physical flourishing, and spiritual flourishing. These were all at the points of this idea of the year of Jubilee and what God is doing in his community here. So today, we can, we can argue the merits of economic um, machinery, right? We can argue the, the, the merits and demerits of capitalism and socialism and any other ism that you want to put in there. But the one thing I think this shows is that both of the systems that we have are deeply flawed. Both systems. We've seen how, 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 um, how capitalism can run amok. We have seen how socialism can, can run amok. Both of these systems are deeply flawed, but this, is, but this is the point here. The economy of a new creation will actually work and promote flourishing for everyone. When Jesus comes to say, I am the Jubilee, this is what he's saying. I care about both the soul and the body. I care about both. Not either or, not just the soul. I care about both. And what, do we, what can we do now? We can look to set up patterns among us with systems of flourishing grace and justice. Why? Because this, verse 8, For I, the Lord, love justice, and I hate robbery and wrong. I hate it. And I love justice. And this is what I want to see in the city where I am the light of the world. And not only that, not only that, but God calls us priests, right? Verse, shoot, um, it's there, I promise you. <laughs> what was that? Six, thank you, yes. Uh, but you shall be called priests of the Lord. You are going to be the ones to purvey this idea of grace and justice throughout all the nations. You're going to be such an attractive people that people are going to seek you out because this is what life should be like and they know it. This was God's idea from the beginning. You are to be purveyors of grace and justice to, of, of Yahweh to all of the nations. And that's why he made you to be light. That's why when God comes and he dwells among his people, his people radiate the light of God. Chapter 62. God's great substitution. Um, I, we just went over Isaiah 53, right? Where he talks about this, this idea, this identity of the servant. Um, there are striking contrasts right now to Zion here, or God's people and his servant. And I want to walk through a couple of those. For Zion's sake, just read, just read along chapter 62. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And what does it say about the servant in chapter 53? He opened not his mouth. Let's keep going. The nations... Um, the nations shall, shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. The nations will see how glorious you are. But yet, among the servant, we turned our faces from him. The nations of the world are looking to you, but we turned our faces to the servant. You will be beautiful. You'll be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You will be a beautiful, valuable crown. But we will esteem the servant not. You will not be forsaken. Right? You shall no more be termed forsaken. Your land shall no more be termed desolate. But the servant will be. The servant in Isaiah 53 will be. You will have salvation and be rewarded, but the servant is going to be taking on our stripes. He will be bruised and crushed for our iniquities. Don't you see what, what's happening here? This anointed conqueror is going to come in and he's going to redeem this people, but it's going to look completely different than anyone expected. He does that by substituting himself for us. We can keep going on through Isaiah 62, where, we, where uh, verse 10, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people, build up, repair the city, build up the highway, clear it of stones, and you're going to be a signal for the people. You are going to be my preview of what life is like. 
when I have substituted my place for you, you are going to be the shining city on a hill that can't be hid. And how is it going to happen? Well, let's look at chapter 63. We get to the bookend of the section where the warrior comes back from the beginning of chapter 59. The warrior sent out with a, with, with a, with a helmet and the robe, and he's looking like he's getting ready to kick some butt, right? This is, this is the warrior who's getting ready to exact his vengeance and redeem his people. Then we get to chapter 63. There's a lot of wordplay going on here, so it's kind of a fascinating few verses. Who is this who comes from Edom? in crimson garments from Basra, who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. The fun, I, I, I kind of laughed after I read this quite a, quite a few, few times. Um, this, guy comes, this, this guy comes in, just, just picture it. There's, there's watchtower set in front, in front of the city, and we see this, this figure coming in from the horizon. We can't tell who or what or what it is just, just, just yet. But as it, is, it gets closer, the watchtower folks, they yell out, who are you? What are you doing? What are you, what are you here for? And he says, it's I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. And the guy who responded and said, why are you covered in blood? That doesn't make any sense. You say you're just speaking righteousness, then why in the world are you covered in blood? Right? That, that'd be like me coming in today, I'm covered in blood. And you guys would be like, Bobby, what in the world? why are you covered in blood? Well, I'm preaching today. I have so many questions right now, I don't even know where to start. That doesn't make any sense. Why is your apparel, why is your apparel red and your garments like who treads the wine press? I have trodden the wine press alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood splattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. I looked up, but there was no one to help. I was appalled, but there was no one to uphold. So my own arm, here's the arm again, my own arm brought me salvation, and my wrath upheld me. I trampled down the peoples in my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath, and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. And that's where we stop, okay? Great way to end. Seems a little crazy, right? God is providing justice by punishing those who have opposed him and oppressed his people. God's ultimate goal is still this, is, is still to redeem the world through the saving of his people. And God is going to do what they couldn't do. But we're still kind of left like, did it have to end like that? Did it have to end so bloody and so gross? But here's what I want us to think about, and, I've, and I think we've talked about this before. There can't be a day of salvation without a day of vengeance. Salvation and vengeance have to go hand in hand. I think I got a quote up here. N.T. Wright said this, We have judged apartheid and found it wanting. We judge child, uh, child abusers and find them guilty. We judge genocide and find it outrageous. And we have discovered what the psalmist knew, that for God to judge the world meant that he would, in the end, put it all to rights. Straighten it out, producing not just a sigh of relief all around, but shouting for joy among the trees and the fields and the sea and the floods. There has to be someone to pay for the injustice in the world. This is, what, this is what God's anointed conqueror is out to get. He's out to set things right the way they should be. That's what, this, that's what the city life is like, where there's flourishing and when injustice is at bay. Salvation and vengeance have to go hand in hand. Miroslav Volf, he's a Croatian philosopher, theologian. Um, he, he wrote a book called Exclusion and Embrace. And in this book, his main thesis is this. My thesis is that the practice of nonviolence requires a belief in divine vengeance. My thesis will be unpopular with the man in the West, but imagine speaking to people as I have whose cities and villages have been first plundered and then burned and leveled to the ground, whose daughters and sisters have been raped, whose fathers and brothers have had their throats slit. Imagine saying to this, this group of people, don't retaliate. Don't, don't take back what was taken from you. 
Imagine saying to the people, why not? I say the only means of prohibiting violence by us is to insist, is to insist that violence is only legitimate when it comes from God. Violence thrives today secretly nourished by the belief that God refuses to take the sword. If we don't believe that God is going to one day set all things right, if we don't believe that, then no wonder we're going to take the sword. No wonder we're going to act out in violence. No one is there to mete out justice. No one is there to set the oppressed free. God is going to set all things right. He goes on to say this, and this is, this is, <laughs> this is tough for us here in a suburbia to swallow. It takes the quiet of a suburb for the birth of this thesis that human nonviolence is a result of a God who refuses to judge. Let me say that again because it t- took me like 10 times. It takes the quiet of a suburb for the birth of this idea that human nonviolence is a result of a God who refuses to judge. If we have had it so easy in the suburban life, and we say to people who have been oppressed, who have had their families taken from them, who have had their entire life's work gone, we say, you should be nonviolent. It's because we haven't experienced injustice on, our, on ourselves. We haven't experienced the lash. If God were not angry at injustice and deception and lies and sin and did not make a final end of violence, that God would not be worthy of our worship. But here we are, we are, we are being shown that God is going to make all things right, but we still don't know exactly how. We don't know whose blood this anointed conqueror is covered in. So, I have four things. Sorry, five things. And then we'll wrap up. The first one is a question that I'd like some interaction with. It's this. If God loves justice and shalom, like we see here, how should his people respond? If God loves justice and shalom, how should we respond? It's not a rhetorical question. <laughs> I've, I've, I've got stuff here, so it's, it, it's okay if you... Okay, Johnny. Um, if he loves justice and shalom, that should be crucial to who we are as followers of him. So we should be seeking out actively injustice, not waiting for it to passively mm. come across it in whenever I'm going across it. I should yeah. be seeking out ways in which to promote justice and shalom, whether that be making myself uncomfortable in order to make someone else comfortable, hmm. yeah. uh, giving up things that I think are important so that I can bring comfort and peace to those who don't have it, ultimately yeah. to make myself uncomfortable. Hmm. Yeah, um, we're kind of shielded from, from it a lot here. Yeah, Amy. No, 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 you're good. My thought is that practicing Sabbath is a way mm. to um, respond. That yeah. there is a way in which resting from my labor acknowledges that it's celebrating my smallness. Hmm. It's it's acknowledging that I I need to participate with God. Yeah. In justice in the in the bringing of justice and in the bringing of shalom and quiet myself enough that I can even hear mm. what those things are. Because I think, like your suburban quote, I think I need to keep stepping back and saying, God, what's my idea and what is your heart? Yeah. And unless I create space to do that, that doesn't happen. Right. Yeah, we get, we get kind of, um, we, we are run by different taskmasters Right? Instead of justice and peace and mercy and, and like we're we're run by this constant need to prove ourselves. And and what the Sabbath does is it realigns that. It says, No, 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 no. You you work because God is good to you. You you work because it is an outflow of how you are meeting needs and how you are serving other people. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I just find it hard to uh they seem like extreme opposites to me, justice and hmm. peace. Yeah. And in this world, because so it's kind of hard to live in both live in both at the same time. Yeah. Because 
it, a lot of times, uh, we're, at least with me, I'm waiting for God to come to bring about the justice hmm. um, and, and thus the peace. And so to, to live in both, um, it kind of tears, tears me from both sides, I guess. It, yeah. There's like a black and white. Yeah, there's that spectrum. seeming tension, right? Like yeah. um, where like we see all this stuff that's happening. We want someone to come back and fix it. But then how do we – then what does it look like to live as peaceful, shalom bringers to worlds that are broken? And it's like I, I, don't, I don't know sometimes, right? Like it, it just feels so far apart sometimes. Well, and you brought up the thing about politics, and that's like our <laughs> – Yeah. <laughs> A lot of people think about politics and are trying to – have social justice with their politic, and it never brings peace. Yeah. So it's, I don't know, it, it, that's where I think we get bad examples of it. Yeah, and, um, and since you talked about it, one of my points is, is, is that politics, neither party has a monopoly on this idea of social justice and righteousness, right? N neither party does. Um, in, in, in the politics of the kingdom, um, what is going to be different? The politics of the kingdom is truth and justice and shalom is going to reign, right? Politics can't do that. Like we can, we, can, we can vote and we can act in ways that benefit the least of these and benefit the most vulnerable and vote and, and lay down our power for that. Um, but politics isn't going to be the answer. And, and trust me, I love talking about politics. Um, um, but but we've, we've got to, especially the, Amer the American church has to come to grips with the fact that neither party has a monopoly on faith. Neither party has a monopoly on the way things, on the way things should be. We can argue who's got more, fine, but neither party's going to do it. I remember, I remember, Bobby, when we started back early, Isaiah, and this idea of justice or dealing with evil, the goal is shalom, and it immediately... My idea and thought brought it to the family, hmm. our families, and I kind of put it out on Facebook and some of solo people responded, they were thinking the same. And I think um, we, we, if we can really wrestle with this, how, how does what God is going to do eventually, when you're talking about how will people experience this, we can look sometimes at the big Mm -hmm. Picture, how can I go join a march, which is fine, mm -hmm. all those kinds of things. You know where I'm yep. going. Yeah. But if it's not happening right here, and, and this is the hardest, is what in my home, because hmm. <clears throat> I can remember when um, <clears throat> Julie was probably fourth grade, I think Jenny was second grade, John was first, and sat at our table and said, this is going to stop. We're going to change how, and my, my hurt was, we're not having shalom mm -hmm. here. Because we're all sinners. Well, we took a whole family vacation to try to see how can we see it change. And it's a challenge. Yeah. It takes a lot of work. Yeah. And I, and I think a lot of us will immediately go to the big picture ideas, right? Um, but there's, but there's and, and I'm going to talk about this here in the next point. So I should I talk about it now? Um, but, but, it's, but it's this idea of like, are we having, are we sharing meals with with, str with with strangers, do we do we give up our things for the sake of others? Like it's it's the little things that I think are going to be um, that I think are going to make a big difference. It's not it's not always going to be like, yep, my idea is I'm going to run for president or I'm going to run for you know those could be things, but it's like okay, share a meal, learn from somebody that is different from you, um, learn from someone who's got different experiences, who may share different viewpoints, listen and learn. Um, some of those things are going to be. Or what we're talking about too, Rob. Did you say you're running in 2020? <laughs> no. Bobby for president. Mm. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, the thing that comes to mind to me here on this question, and it's kind of related here, is um, I find my heart kind of like tends to constantly come back to I need to be God. Mm. Uh, and so whatever my effort is, I need to have like a godlike. Um, result, you mm. know, from it. Yeah. And so it's pretty easy to get discouraged and frustrated when you make a step towards shalom in someone's life or justice. Uh, like, you know, you, you give of yourself and then that thing doesn't turn out the way you'd hoped yeah. or, or the intention is hijacked or the response is, you know, opposite of what you would have. Like, like you, 
Um, I was talking with <clears throat> um, Peter about this earlier today. In the very gift that you have given or the opportunity you have been pr that you have provided seems to have been used to further uh, poor choices and more mm. lack of shalom. Yeah. And so um, I think, uh, you know, I appreciate what Amy said. There's a, like, you know, we have to sit in our not godness yeah. and rest there uh, and repent because I, you know, because I, I wanted to manipulate a situation in a godlike sort of way yeah. to re achieve a result. And I actually have to rest in that. If God called me to that thing, then all I had to do was obey yep. and be faithful, not achieve whatever result. Yep. Um, and then when the result wasn't what I had hoped, I'd, I don't need to stop obeying and mm -hmm. stop being faithful, you know, because of the potential hijacking of whatever gift right. you have given over yourself. We're not God, you know? Yeah. So this is like God loves it, and I can rest in his ultimate shalom even as I uh, imperfectly pursue, um, yeah. you know, yeah. justice and shalom. Yeah. That one's really hard. Yeah, when, <laughs> when we feel like we are doing good things, we expect that thing to actually take place. And we've seen in chapter 59 the brokenness of this world. That's not going to happen, and that's kind of where we're sitting, and we feel it. Um, but not until Jesus, not until God is the full light of the city will things actually work perfectly like that, right? So that's, so that's kind of that tension of we hope for that, we're going to start working for that, but at the same time we're sitting in with this tension of... It's not quite there, and I want it to be so bad. That's good. Okay. This one is just a truth. You don't have to answer. Like, so this is just, just, a, just a truth. Second, God's covenant favor with his people is the power for mission. We've seen in, verse chapter, in, uh, in chapter 59 at the end, and this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit is upon you, and my words I put in your mouth. And those words shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or your mouth of your children's offspring from this time forevermore. God's covenant to his people pushes them out on mission. And we know that this mission is not going to be easy. This mission is a way of self-sacrifice. This mission is a way of praying for your enemies. And it's not, it's not a mission of power. I think that a lot of times... We have historically made this idea of mission, this idea of wanting to make, um, wanting to wanting to to hold this Christian identity that we believe America has. Um, we have made it a way of power. So, what does it look like for for our nation to be one where God is the King? Is it that we have prayer in public schools? Probably not. Is it that we have Ten Commandments sitting on a court courthouse step? Nope, probably not. When Martin Luther King Jr. led a peaceful protest of love and hope, that brought about enormous change. Christian leaders like Desmond Tutu brought a massive change to South Africa with remarkably little bloodshed. Little change, like when his church advocates for the underprivileged and invites strangers into their home to share a meal, to sit and listen and learn. You are responding out of this idea of covenant relationship with Yahweh. When you interact with people in your neighborhood and schools and you speak out against those injustices, you are responding out of the covenant-powered mission of God. So God's covenant favor with his people is the power for mission. Third, your work matters. I'm sure some of us this week have, strugg have struggled believing that. We feel that our work is either too little, too menial, not glamorous, and in chapter 61, the Bible gives dignity to plain old-fashioned work. Um, through your work, and, th and this, is, this is the missional thrust of your work. Through your work, you are being a blessing to others, right? Um, we, we all can kind of think of ways that our work currently blesses other people. But what you also need to know is that other people's work is also a blessing to you, right? You go out for a nice dinner. You are blessed by the rancher who grew or who raised the meat or who grew the vegetables. You are blessed by that person. You are blessed by the chef who takes spinach and actually makes it taste good. <laughs> you are blessed by the server 
who waits on your ever on your ever crazy needs. You are blessed by people, and God uses those people to bless you. You want to know how God feeds us every day? He feeds us through ranchers. He feeds us through table waiters. He feeds us through normal, everyday, dirty work. Jesus was a working stiff. He was a manual laborer. And I know a lot of us always ask, how how can we glorify God in our work, in everyday work? Well, um, Just for an example, let's take an airline pilot. How would an airline pilot glorify God in his everyday work? Well, land the plane. Do a good job. Land the plane in a way that you can use it again the next time, right? It's not not going over the intercom and saying, okay, I'm going to read a passage or I'm going to pray before we take off. Give us grand traveling mercies. It's not that. It's land the stinking thing. Work is frustrating. I know. But God is using your work, no matter how menial, to be a way to love God and to benefit others. This last one, sorry, second last one. Um, This one's rhetorical. Do you see yourself as beautiful? That one's hard for some some of us. Because we feel the dinginess and the dirtiness of this world, and we take on that identity. We feel whether we've been taken advantage of, whether we've been used, whether we feel like we've been just some hot commodity. The world doesn't make us beautiful. You've been through pain, you've been through brokenness, you feel neglected. That's what the world makes you feel like at times. And what does God do? You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You will be no more forsaken. And your name, your identity is, I delight in you. You are beautiful. If you are... In, in, the, in this kingdom of God, if you're in this messy work, if you are a child of God, he considers you beautiful no matter how broken you feel. And that's hard. The level of brokenness even in this room is, is different. And it's hard for some of us to believe that. But God sees yourself as beautiful. God sees you as beautiful. So much so that he substituted his beauty and gave it to you. And he, took on, and, he, and he took your ashes. He took the ugliness of what this world has dumped on you. And he's called you beautiful. Last one. God's vengeance and judgment is against brokenness and injustice. And this leads us into our final question. How is Jesus the hero of all of this? So this military hero that we see in chapters 59 and 63, the one dressed in red, The weapons that our hero uses to win this battle and provide justice and shalom for all of his people is his own blood and self-sacrifice. This takes us to Revelations where Jesus is coming again and his robes dipped in blood, but it's the slain blood of the lamb. Where Where there was no one else to do the work, Jesus hung on a cross alone and he atones for your sin. His own arm has brought you salvation. Jesus does that for you. He atones for you. His blood was poured out for you. Do you accept that? Do you you apply that to yourself? God substituted himself for you. He gave up his beauty for you. You got a crown of jewels, a crown of jewels while he took your ashes. He spoke out against injustice for your sake while he was silent for his own. He was forsaken so you could be betrothed. And because of Jesus, God delights in you. So now, church, God, the light of the world, has made his church, has made his people to be the light of this world too. So that we can demonstrate and declare good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, and to set the oppressed free. This idea to make heaven and earth not seem so far away anymore. So will you pray with me? We'll take the Lord's table after this.